Welcome to the Inside Silverstone podcast, a business-focused podcast covering all things tech, engineering and innovation. Hosted by me, Chris Broom, a huge tech, motorsport and gaming fan, and also the owner of Longhurst, a firm of lifestyle financial planners and independent financial advisors located in Silverstone, Northamptonshire. This is a series of unscripted and unpolished conversations with leading business owners, thought leaders and high-tech talent where we discuss their experiences within the Silverstone business and motorsport region. We will also be asking them to share their knowledge, insight and their thoughts on the future just for you. If you're looking to learn more about the Silverstone high growth region and commercially connect with like-minded peers, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome to Inside Silverstone. Welcome to the next edition of Inside Silverstone. My name's Chris Broom and I am your host today. I am delighted to welcome you to the British Racing Drivers Club at Silverstone Circuits, where we are recording a special mastermind sessions, number five, titled Women in Engineering. Welcome to the show. I have three amazing guests who are very kindly to come, kindly agreed to come here on a Friday morning. Uh, premise of the show will be to do some quick introductions and then to run through the questions as we normally do. So, introductions, and I'm gonna start with yourself. So, who are you, what's your background, what's the story? My name is Catherine Richards. I am a wind tunnel test technician at Mercedes Formula One team, and my background is um, aerospace engineering. Okay. Uh, my name is Christiana Pace. Um, I'm a, a motorsport and sustainability consultant. I've been in motorsport for about 20 years in different roles. Uh, and my background uh, is a um, uh, mechatronics engineer. Okay. Yourself? Um, my name's Lena Gade. I am an engineer as well. My background's aerospace um, engineering too. Um, I've done a lot of race engineering. I currently work for a company called Multimatic. Um, and my role there is as a vehicle dynamics um, manager. Okay. First question, which I love asking, the genesis behind why you got involved in engineering. So what's the story? Is it something from a childhood, helping dad or mum tinker in the garage? What, what's the sort of story behind why you do what you do? So if I start with yourself, Lena. Um, well, I was about eight or nine when I got interested in engineering. Um, as a kid, uh, actually, it was nothing to do with my mum and dad. They never really used to get us involved in that kind of thing. Um, I'm, my parents are Indian in origin. Um, although I was born here, we moved back to India for a short period of time. And um, whilst I was there with my two younger sisters to keep ourselves entertained, um, when the electricity was turned off mainly, um, we'd take stuff apart in the house and put it back together again. <laughs> okay, and amazing. Then, uh, my mum <laughs> and dad sort of thought, well, you know, this could lead on to something bigger. And they were the ones that introduced us to this term engineering. Um, and introduced us to family friends who had a son studying engineering. That's what got myself and my um, middle sister involved. Amazing. And, and is your middle sister still involved in? She in... is. She works for Toro Rosso. Oh, not Toro Rosso. What are they call now? Alpha, Alpha Tori. Tori. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Mum and dad must be obviously immensely proud. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Good. Background? Um, I got. I probably got involved in engineering at the same well, interested in engineering at the same time, like eight, nine years old, but mainly because my dad, uh, it's like my dad is not an engineer, but was like an electronic technician. Mm. And uh, we used to live in a part of Italy that used to be the um, high tech cluster for uh, um, um, electronics in the 80s and the 90s. So we had Texas Instrument, IBM, all the big uh, company there. And my dad used to work for them as an R&D uh, technician. So we had lots of things brought home that we had to crash test and make sure that they were not breaking. And if they were breaking, we needed to fix it. Mm. Um, so that's really how I got in, uh, interested. I just thought, oh, this is actually quite good. And we used to take things apart. And then I remember when I was 12, my dad used to take me to do his work and I could actually see things. And uh, they, they used to have uh, two or three days in Texas Instrument where like, the kids of the employees could go in and actually mm. do some work. Mm. Uh, and that's where I got, I thought, oh, this is quite good. I quite like to be that. So that's uh, what, uh, what interested me. Nice. And F1, wind tunnels, engineering? Well, I actually started off somewhere different. When I was at school, I wanted to be an airline pilot. That's what I really wanted. I wanted to fly. Amazing. I wanted to fly Concorde. That was my big aim. Really? So I did all my um, studies at school, aimed towards that. And then I needed to bridge a little gap before I went off to British Airways Flying School. So I went off to college to do H&D and aerospace studies. Mm. 
that's when I got introduced to aerodynamics. And at that time is when Michael Schumacher started racing. I started, started getting into F1. Mm. So I oh, quite like this. So I wrote to the Benison factory because I wanted to go on a factory tour and go and see it all. Um, and I got a, a letter back from a, a lovely chap called Willem Toet. Went to see the uh, factory, asked, oh, have you got wind tunnel? Where's that? Oh, no, no, that's not here. That's in Farnborough. And I said, well, I'm studying in Farnborough. To cut a long story short, went to the wind tunnel in Farnborough a little while later, mm. um, saw Willem again, did a project for my H&D with Willem, with mm. Benetton, never looked back, I forgot the flying bit. And, wow, um, wow, wow, wow. So if it actually wasn't for him and his support through my studies and his faith in me, I wouldn't be where I am today. I mean, he has been a, a massive support and he was, um, so I was actually in Germany before I had this job doing um, environmental aerodynamics mm. um, after my PhD. And he kept saying, oh, come, 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 we've got a new wind tunnel. Uh, it was BAR Honda then. Mm. Um, and I said, well, I can't come just yet because I'm still doing this. So when I got back to England, I went for what I thought was a, an informal chat with his boss. Turned out to be an interview. Mm. And that was 15 years ago. So There we go. Yeah. I've got a list of questions here, but I just want to continue the theme of what you're talking about there. So how, how important is it, to, to, do you think, to, to have that type of support, potentially role model? Um, certainly, you know, we, we're recording this and it's going to be aired during International Women's Day and International Women's Week. So, you know, that, do you think that was a lucky break? Do you think that was down to hard work? Do you think that was just a bit of fortuity that obviously you're studying there as well? What to, uh, a little bit of both. So... Um, I wrote a letter basically when I was at college. I wrote a letter to the Benson factory saying, "Can I come and see your factory?" Random letter just to yeah, who yeah. make concern. Yeah. Um, lucky enough that Willem replied, so that was sort of you know lucky for me. And when I met him, he he's I mean I'm still really great friends with him today. Mm. Um, we're actually going skiing in a few weeks. Um, nice. But. Um, he had the faith in me. He saw obviously saw something in me, and he supported me all the way through my um, H and D and my degree, and um, all through even just through some personal um, setbacks that I had during sure. my college time. Um, and he stayed with me that whole time. And then when it came round to actually being in a position to take a uh, take a job, mm. he had the faith in me to put me forward for that job. So I bit of luck because if I hadn't written that letter it would have never have happened oh yeah but you, but, but you wrote the letter so I, yes yeah. and I always say to people when people say to me you know oh I'd love to go and do this I say write a letter all I can do is say no this is what happened to me and look where I am now but he also had the faith in me and he's always been there for me and he's always been my sort of mentor mm. and that, that that's massive and that's it's, it's good to have somebody who has that faith particularly when you have a time when you're thinking maybe I shouldn't be doing this or maybe sure. you know you're not self-doubt or otherwise yeah. which is very normal it's as a human it's always good to have someone there yeah. to remind you that no you can do it and is that is that a, that's obviously a fantastic positive story is that, is that common within engineering irrespective of sex gender diversity anything is, is that normal are there other challenges out there I mean how, how was your I mean that's a fantastic first story what, what was yours I, I came into motorsport quite late, so in my family nobody was interested in motorsport. We were all interested in electronics uh, and in motorbikes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all, I, I had a motorbike when I was uh, 14, so it's kind of like my dad had a motorbike. It was like, a, but um, nobody really knew anything about motorsport. But then I did my university in Bologna. That is a big, uh, obviously, engineering and motorsport is a big part of uh, their history, mm. and I think. Uh, for me, it was a bit more like, uh, oh, I'm going to go and have a look uh, at Imola circuit, what they're going to do, because I, don't, I didn't have anything to do at the weekend. So I was like, oh, let's go and have a look. And then I got involved into the um, uh, motorsport bit through the Italian ASN, your Motorsport UK equivalent. Uh, so I was a scrutineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I found lots of people mentoring me and trying to support me to actually take up motorsport as a proper job rather than a hobby. Yeah. So, I think it's a bit of uh, both, as uh, Catherine said, it's like it's people supporting you to learn the skill and to drive you through the hurdle of uh, trying to get where you want mm. and uh, also you trying to work hard to show them that you can do that and sure. that is really what you want to do. So it's a, it's a mix of uh, skill, passion, luck and really want dri being dri driven to do that thing. Yeah, yeah. And what about yourself, Lena? 
How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> a few minutes for this one, but however long. So my sister and I got interested in motorsport exactly the same time. We came back to the UK and at this point, um, it was just a few years before Schumacher actually was on the scene. We, Nigel Mansell was the guy to follow yeah. in England. And we'd moved back to a part of London that we'd lived in originally. So she went to the same school she'd just left three years before and got back together with her friends who were watching F1. And that got us hooked because we started watching it on TV. You're listening to Murray Walker and James Hunt. And, yeah. mm. you know, they were the best yeah, yeah, at what yeah. they did. Yeah. Um, at that time, though, there was this um, element of the Formula One races where maybe for the first time they'd been looking in the background to the engineers and what they were doing. And because we got an understanding of that, that's all we wanted. Mm. And my dad in particular was a bit like, what do you want to do that for? It seems like a very niche kind of area to go into. So initially he wasn't really that supportive of it. He wanted us to go off and do something a bit more secure and, you know, um, that had a, a possibility of getting a good job afterwards because he was an immigrant to this country. He spent two weeks on a ship getting here um, with a visa to come and be an architect and he knew how hard it was for him back in the 60s. So he didn't want the same thing for us. Ultimately, um, both of us kind of went down the same route. We tried to keep getting work experience and I kept doing that all the way through um, my working career because I went to work at Jaguar when I got out of university. I didn't have enough experience. Tina, on the other hand, um, ended up at Formula Palmer Audi and then one thing led to another. She stayed on at university, did an MSc, then she went to Cranfield, she did another master's, then she ended up at Triple Eight. And so her route was a bit different. She never really worked in automotive like I did. But all the while, all we wanted to do was be in motorsport as engineers. We didn't really know exactly which area. Um, she had wanted to be an aerodynamicist at Williams. That was her dream job. She got that. It wasn't really the dream job. And so she didn't do it for more than a year. But we basically just kept chipping away at it. And I think um, we had support from within the industry. There was one stage where she was um, a data engineer for Triple Eight. I was a data engineer in Formula BMW. So we were both in the same paddock together. Mm. And you've got two different areas of the paddock with the single seaters and then the touring cars. Almost everyone knew who we were because we just went and talked to everybody. Cool. Saying how great it was that we wanted to be in this industry and we wanted to be working for them. Mm. So everyone knew who we were. And my lucky break really was um, having done Formula BMW for a while, um, I ended up with um, a sports car team who went to Le Mans. That was Chamberlain Synergy. And because I knew some people within that group, um, and I was still working full time at Myra at this point. Um, they introduced me to um, a group who were working on a Jaguar GT3 car. But their ra one of their engineers was also a race engineer for Audi Sport in the US. And when I went to meet them, one of the things they asked me was, would you like to be an assistant race engineer um, out in the US? And I was like, ah, oh, sounds great. Mm. So I ended up doing that. I didn't even know it was for the Audi Sport stuff. They just said it was an Audi and it could have been any Audi. Mm. I went out there and I've never looked back since 2007, whenever that was. And so I've got notes on, you know, everyone's career. So how did you get on at Le Mans? It was all right. <laughs> I mean, I was with Audi for nine years and um, I was very lucky to be part of um, a lot of their successes and a couple of uh, failures, let's say. Sure. Um, I became a race engineer after Le Mans in 2010. And the year after when I went there as a race engineer for the first time, um, I was lucky enough to win. Boom. <laughs> first female race engineer to win Le Mans 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, yeah. right? That's so inspirational. And so how, so thank you. And so the, so the careers to date, how has engineering evolved for, for females, entering, career progression, fantastic stories, but, but how do you think it's evolved since sort of day dot for, for each of you? For, for me, when I first started, I've been in my job now, I'll be 15 years in September. When I started, um, there were very few ladies in the team. Right. Very few. It was quite a small team then because it was BAA Honda then. Sure. Um, I was certainly the only lady in the aerodynamics department for certain. What was that like? Um, the honest truth, it didn't bother me because everyone was, because I'd come through um, doing aerospace studies, aerospace engineering, that kind of thing at college. I was used to being just one of a few women yeah. in the group yeah. so it actually didn't worry me too much yeah. and then everyone was so great I mean from the first day that I arrived nobody was like oh what's she doing here what's she everyone was brilliant yeah. you know really welcoming uh, you know threw me in the deep end but sure. that, that's fine um, and how is it now I'm still as far as I know to my knowledge I still am the only winter on test technician in Formula One 
And really? there, I don't believe there are any really? female model makers, but there are quite a few aerodynamicists now. We've got um, three or four in our department, and oh. then factory wide, there are a lot more like girls on the factory floor, as it were. Mm. So obviously you've got the HR department marketing, but in sort of vehicle dynamics and um, track side, there are a lot more ladies. But it's still, you know, quite a small percentage when you look at the size of the team. But it is improving. It is getting better. Yeah, why is that? Is that just is that a schooling thing? Is that for uh, encouragement? What's the? I think it, it does. I think it is from school level. Yeah, right, I think I it's that. always going to be. Yeah. Um, I don't don't think you can get away with it. You know, girls and boys. You know, when when girls are small, it's pink and dolls, and when boy, it's and I think it's it. You know, it's going to start from when they're really really young. I mean, I've I've got a nephew. He's he's two years old. You know, and he loves cars and he loves hitting things with hammers and things like that. And that's what he is. You know, because he, he's a little boy. And then if he had if it was a little girl, I'm sure they'd be playing with their dolls. And it's you know it's. It's just instinct when they're young mm. to start them off on what is that they're Seems used to. to be normal, yeah. Yeah. Um, I and I think in yeah. schools it should be at a young age they should be um, giving youngsters the choice of activities of what they want to do. I think as well is peer pressure because uh, yeah. what I'm seeing uh, in the in the past few years through there to be different mm. uh, we are kind of mentoring some girls to go through the study and what yeah. they want to do to become engineers mm. and you see that uh, it's all good uh, from primary until they are about 15. Yes. And then we're 15 they're really scared about what their friends will think about they want to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this peer pressure where engineering is not the right word to use it yeah. and it's not the right profession for a woman that is coming out and uh, they much better be an architect or a, mm -hmm. a fashion designer or something else. So, And I saw quite a lot of girls when they're 15 they said to me, actually I just thought uh, I don't really want to be an engineer anymore, yeah. I'm just going to do something else. As a young girl, that she's, she's part of that um, uh, initiative who was introduced to me um, during her A levels um, or I don't know during her GCSEs going to A levels and she was having a massive wobble she wanted to go into Formula One but she was getting a big confidence crisis and everything else and I was introduced to her and I you know I only through emails initially um, I was writing to her and giving her a bit of support yeah. and um, you know it's cut long story short she came to work experience with me at my workplace yeah. now she's at um, Loughborough and she's just she, she knows where she's going. She's got her sights on being an aerodynamicist. Um, we've got her on the radar. Um, you know, and that was just through her having, you know, she's she's having the wobble. She's not really sure. Then being put in touch with someone who's already doing the job. Mm -hmm. um, and then that just really helped her. And then she's now well on her way. Yeah, so we need we, we need more of that at a younger level. Mm -hmm. um, and just to, you know, just to show young girls that, it's open to them. They can do, you know, there's so much that they can do. They might not want to be an engineer. You know, they might look at it and go, I don't want to do that. I want to be a hairdresser. Sure. But just to give them the choice and to just show them what's available. And the visibility of it. Yeah, because they might not know. Do they even know it exists? Yeah. Exactly. Some of them don't. I mean, no. I, I went to do a presentation in 2012 um, just outside Dublin. And it was um, to encourage, well, actually, it was designed to show what kind of en um, careers were in science, technology and engineering. And... There were a huge group of teachers in this room, um, people from within the governmental organisations that support ed education, and then groups of students. And they were sat at the back of um, the room. It was a huge, huge um, kind of auditorium. Yeah. And uh, what they'd done, what the organisers had done, is they brought people in from different industries to do a presentation. So there was someone there who was on the Muppet Show. And they brought oh, the puppets awesome. along to show oh, all of that oh, stuff, man. right? Oh. And then someone from Lego saying what his day job was. You know, 9 a.m. he rocks up at work and he goes into the playroom, yeah. Imagine so that. I, oh. I looked at all of this and I thought, well, their jobs sound way more interesting than mine. Yeah. When I got up onto the stage, the way they had done it, uh, there was a guy who lived locally who was a big fan of Audi. So he bought his rally car to um, the event and they had these huge doors. So they drove the car in. Well, that got everyone's attention. Sure. After which, um, the lady organising it was really annoyed. And she said, um, the kids were just on their phones the whole way through. I don't know what they were doing. And I said, well, you know, the kids. And then she realised that the only thing they had tweeted about 
was this person that was stood on stage talking about engineering and a whole group of the girls that were in that group came to me and they said we didn't even know what engineering was until just then and it's too late for us to choose our subjects now because they were 14 or 15 mm. so they couldn't wow. um, go off to become engineers mm. at least they thought they couldn't and I said well you know there's other ways and means of doing it you can go and get apprenticeships. Yeah. Um, it's not too late. You can change your subjects if you wanted to, but that's got to be a decision for you to make. Mm. You need to ask your teachers what's involved. I think one of the problem that you may have in this country that uh, engineer is a word that you use as well. It's not used appropriately, engineers in this country. You know, you've got, you've very got broad, a, isn't yeah, it? it's very, very broad, and it gives the wrong idea of which kind of work you do. Mm. So I never really felt any problem to be an engineer, a woman in engineering in Italy. When I was working in Italy um, with motorsport, there was a woman trucky, there was a woman team manager, and that was in 1998. <laughs> it was a long time ago, and there is still woman trucky, woman engineer, and then there was a woman um, doing the composite repair, that then she went to Toyota F1, so there was quite a good mix and a good uh, uh, average. Not, not very many uh, women racing drivers, I have to say, mm. but like engineers and other professions, yes. When I arrived to this country, so I arrived to this country to do my last year of uh, university in one, uh, one company that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. But I remember the first month I was not allowed uh, to go in the engineering office. Why? So, <laughs> well, <laughs> so, and it's kind of like I had to fight. That's it was quite funny. But I had to fight my way telling them, but I'm doing engineering and actually contributed to what they were doing uh, so that I could gain a place there. Yeah. But that was back in the 90s where it was, and, and it, that's where the first times I thought, well, maybe it's not really accepted. And I, when I got into motorsport and into the wider uh, UK community, things were a bit different. But I always say the problem with engineering is that the word engineer is used too broadly, so you don't really relate to what actual an engineer does. Mm -hmm. Like if you're boiler break, you call a heating engineer. You sure. do, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. such a wide. Yeah. So, so how could it be changed? So well, that's the question. Yeah, I, there's a perception. Uh, like you, I worked in Germany, yeah. and engineers are viewed very differently over there. The the career is considered. Um, as highly qualified as being a doctor, a lawyer, um, or an accountant, something like that. So it's seen as, you know, you've had to work hard to get to that point, but you're very specialized and you're looking at a particular branch of engineering with a technical speciality for that. Mm. It's not the same over here. I think it's changing slightly. There's certainly more um, girls going on to engineering courses because we do see them a lot more. Um, I've been involved with Formula Student for a little bit um, a few years back. I might be getting involved again this year and I've noticed that there's a lot more of their um, girls who are getting onto that. So there, there's clearly a perception that's changing that it's become acceptable for women to get into it. Whether you can change what engineering means, and I think personally it doesn't just lie with us as engineers but with the companies that we all work for and affiliated to, but also the governing bodies for things like the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, um, the ones for aerospace, for electrical. Mm. They have a responsibility to say, well, this is what it involves. And you do have to work quite hard to get to this point. But when you do get there, this is what it opens up. These are the things that you can deliver as an engineer. Mm. And I don't think we do that very well. And I don't think those bodies do it very well either. They, I think they use language that appeals to them, but that doesn't appeal to someone who knows nothing about engineering or whose parents don't know anything about engineering. But also, I think some youngsters might actually be frightened by the word engineer as well, because they might think, well, I actually am not intelligent enough to go and be an engineer because I need to go to university and I need to do this and I need to do that. But actually, like you said, you, you can do apprenticeships and you can do all sorts that is a different branch of engineering, but we still get you to the same end. Um, I mean, there's a, a, another youngster on the initiative, Dare to be Different, who um, she wanted to be a mechanic. She, she wasn't, um, she didn't want to go to university, so she went through the college route and did the mechanical part. Yeah. And so now, she, now she's a race mechanic, but she's still got to where she wants to be, but she's done it a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also the problem is actually showing youngsters that if you want to get to a certain end in a job, there's lots of different ways to get there. It's not just university. I think university is pushed too hard in schools. Yeah. And some people are scared, you know, they, I have to go because it's what I'm supposed to do. But you're not, you don't have to go to university. There are lots of different ways of getting to, a, to an end and getting into a job that you want to do. You know, I mean, certainly for me, 
um, there's we're, we're a group of nine wind tunnel test technicians where I work, and we all come from different backgrounds. Mm. All of us. Mm. There's one from the RAF. Um, there's one guy who I was actually at college with, and he then went off to do um, engine dynos, and then he's come back round and he works with me now. Mm. Um, there's my background. Um, the chap, my um, direct shift partner, he was on the race team, and now he's come round to be a tunnel techni- test technician. So it, there's lots of different ways to get to the same end, mm. and I think that's something that also needs to be. What's there to be different? So let's explain that because people and, and students will hopefully be watching this. So well, what is that as an initiative? So it's um, well, it's an initiative. Uh, well, there are very there are various initiatives. It's not just good there to be different. It just happened that uh, we both uh, are ambassador of there to be different. But uh, Lina is obviously uh, sit on the Women in Motorsport Commission. Mm-hmm. So there are uh, different initiatives in motorsport mm-hmm. to trying to um, explain girls that uh, there can be motorsport. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, uh, probably 10 years ago, motorsport uh, has actually seen this big gap in number. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of, like, it's a male-dominated world. There was a minority of girls. Sure. And then uh, I think uh, not just the FIA, that is the governing body, but also other, uh, other initiatives uh, locally and yeah. more like... Um, nationally have been trying to push for diversity inclusion and trying to make uh, um, the uh, white community thinking about more how we can include it more women and there to be different is one initiative mm-hmm. um, especially in the uk mm-hmm. in in germany and in australia that has been uh, well was funded by susie wolf um, and uh, she they've been trying to um, do events with primary school girls to right. try to attract them and they've got an engineering uh, we got an engineering activity for them as well nice. but uh, women in motorsport has got girls on track yeah, yeah. and, and they teamed up with dare to be different so there's now events that are held um, actually there's a lot more this year than there were yeah. last year at various different races whether it's formula e f1 uh, wec i think has some as well um, and it's designed to encourage schools to come in to the track and um primarily girls, young girls, so we're talking primary school age or just up to middle school age, will come along and they will experience what type of careers you can get in motorsport. Everything from driving to engineering to mechanicking to um, media. media, media, all of the things. And also that first aid as well, because they have doctors, they show yeah. the doctor, the, you know, yeah. the, the medical side of it as well. Yeah, so yeah. it's all branches. To give you an example, um, well, I, I sit both in girls on track and that to be different mm-hmm. as a STEM coordinator, uh, um, and in both in both of the programs um we actually were uh, in october we were in saudi arabia and we had the 300 girls from primary school saudi wow. school mm. uh, where we did all this activity and the girls that uh, we did uh, um i think there was media environmental activity road safety uh, go-karting and then there was uh, uh, my activity with stem i use lego for stem <laughs> And coding, um, and uh, and all the girls were really amazed. And some of the girls didn't even know how to use Lego because they their culture don't encourage mm. them to do that. So mm. it's a it's a way that uh, the federation and uh, the sponsor and uh, like um, uh, like for example, uh, Susie, uh, an ex mm. F1 driver, mm. trying to uh, give back to the yeah. sport to yeah, try yeah. to encourage uh, mm-hmm. women to try to come in. Well, what we'll do in the show notes that will be on to YouTube and all the podcast platforms, if you can provide me with some of the website links for, for all of these, we'll include them in the show notes so that anyone listening to this can... There can will be an in. event of Girls on Track uh, in July okay. for the Formula E race in London. And I think uh, there is two days open to the public, so that is something probably worth to... For young girls, it's worth mm-hmm. to have a good, uh, look okay great yeah we'll definitely include that in the show notes and so for for those young ladies um but also perhaps for for uh older ladies who have been out of the, the work place because of raising a family for example how, how would you encourage them what would you say to them to, to get them to to consider getting into sort of engineering motorsport mechanics you know everything that you're doing and you're clearly passionate about how would you encourage them to do it what would you say to them i think Engineering in general in this country is, um, we, we just have a shortage. I think actually worldwide there's a shortage of engineers. So whether it's we need engineers in motorsport or whether it's engineers that are needed for biomedical studies, the whole um, arena of engineering is very, very um, lacking, let's say, and certainly in diversity. Um, I think anyone who wants to know what engineering means should just type it into Google. 
because there's a lot of information you can get from there. Um, I didn't know how many branches of engineering there were until I did that presentation I mentioned in, in Ireland. Um, where I had to explain what engineering was. Now, I know what I do, and I know what I did when I worked in automotive, but I had no idea about some of the other areas. It's, it's just exploded and become this huge um, place where people with a background in kind of putting things together and fixing things or coming up with an ingenious way of solving a problem have, have created these industries. And I think people should try and find out what there is available. Motorsport's a bit tougher because to some extent, motorsport is very much a lifestyle. And I think this is a problem for anyone who comes into it. If you're on race team, um, and I do some racing at the moment with the Mazda DPI for Multimatic over in the US, there is a huge amount of travel. Uh, you know, it's, it might be 12 race weekends, but then add on the five tests that we do as well. Um, the fact that you have to go to a simulator, it might not be located in your own country. There's a huge amount of input that has to go in. And so you have to juggle um, what you do and have as a social life versus what you do as a, a working life. Motorsport's quite different. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, he's right. And I think um, one of the things that I truly believe is like in motorsport, it doesn't really matter if you're a girl or a man. It's like a, it's a sport mm. where they need performance. Yeah. Then they're looking for that uh, differentiator that can give them like uh, one millisecond more than everybody else mm. or one little advantage. So if you can do the job, is a is not a discrimination a discriminated place it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman if you can do the job and you are the best at your job is your job is not mm. a problem mm. what what's um what is the limit of motorsport is uh, what lena was saying is a lot of travel is a lot of being away from home uh, is a lot of especially if you want to be in the race team and it's a lot of hours as well because even if you are in the office there is not just 40 hours probably there are 90 hours <laughs> so you got a job and you have to finish it doesn't exist oh i'm going home for the weekend and i come back on monday so is um, there are some constraints in motorsport that obviously are much more than other um, um other sectors but if but it is not a gender discriminating place. You see, it's like if you are good, you are there. If you want to do that and you're committed, and it's feasible. And I always say to everybody, um, I've, I've, work, I've been working with the sport for 20 years. I've done F1 races uh, uh, and test for uh, seven. Um, and I've got a family and it's difficult to balance. But if you find the right person, you can balance together. Mm. The family is not just uh, a woman things. Childcare sure. is not just for women. It's like a, it's something that if you share it, it's possible. And it's just like a, it's not just changing the perception around engineering. I think it's changing the perception around uh, family or how a family should uh, function. should function yeah. exactly. Yeah. That, that is the main things. So yeah. What about yourself? So words of wisdom to, to young ladies looking to come in, or even young men, frankly, um, uh, but also those perhaps looking to come back into the profession. Um, do it just you know if, it, if, you, if it's something that you want to do just go and do it you know write a letter or if you've already been in the, the industry and you've gone away say to a family or to go and do something and coming back again you've still got those skills you haven't lost them yeah. you know you're, you, you've still done whatever you've done in the past and for whatever reason you've been away it doesn't matter if you're still capable of doing the job yeah. then there's no reason why you can't go back into it I mean we've got um, one of our lady aerodynamicists she's um She's now got two children, two young children, and she's been away, come back, been away, come back. But you know, it's it keeps coming back. Yeah, it, but it's it's not a problem. You know, it, it's it, like you say, it shouldn't be a restriction. It mm. shouldn't have to define you. Mm. Um, and I think this is something we need to insist with the youngster as well, because um, um, like I went to one uh, a girl, and it's like in the corridor when I went to her school. Um, I've overheard someone saying, "Why well, you want to go in F one? Then you have kids, and then you have to leave." <laughs> and I was like, "No, this is not what it is." No, so, no. I think it's just like uh, it's mm. lots of different perception to change. It's not just the engineering; it's the society in general. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so if we sort of project twenty years ahead, so the last sort of question that I have on my list is like, if we projected twenty years, very apt of what you just said. What, what do you hope's changed from a perception perspe perspective, from a from an industry perspective? If I was to ask these same questions and get you back on 20 years time, somewhere it's a bit warmer than it is here at the moment, because <laughs> yeah. it's very cold, BRDC. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but if I was to ask these questions in 20 years time, what's the industry like? What's happened? Uh, we have a 
F1 female racing driver. That's got to happen, surely, within 20 years' time. And then uh, she, uh, all the perception will change yeah. because we'll be in the media. And, and uh, I don't know, in 20 years' time, I would hope that uh, we don't have a shortage of engineering anymore. Or yeah, maybe, no. yeah. I hope in 20 years' time, we won't be still talking about a first female engineer having won the Mon, which for me is about to be 10 years next year. How come that hasn't changed? You yeah, know? How, why hasn't that changed? But, you know, in 20 years, it needs to be the norm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I, I, as we said before, there are lots of initiatives that are pushing yeah, for that. Yeah. So we are very hopeful that like, that things will change. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for anybody else? We're good? Thank you. Lena, Cristiana, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, this was uh, recorded for International Women's Day, International Women's Week, uh, Mastermind Session number five, Women in Engineering. Um, produced by the team at Longhurst, uh, very kindly sponsored today by um, Silverstone Park. Um, so big thanks to Ros Bird for supporting this project. Um, show likes, retweets, social media, please do that. Um, we want to make sure that as many people, not just women, young women, but also men, young boys, see this so they can be inspired, hopefully, by these fantastic women to join engineering, potentially motorsport, but otherwise. Um, so please share this as much as you can. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. The Inside Silverstone podcast is produced by the team at Longhurst for the benefit of those with a passion for all things tech, engineering, and innovation. For more information, please visit longhurst.co.uk forward slash Inside Silverstone, whilst also remembering to give us a 5 out of 5 star rating on iTunes. Please note that neither Chris Broom or Longhurst work for Silverstone Park, Silverstone Circuit or Silverstone Technology Cluster. <laughs>